Good evening, everyone. I'm Hannah Smith, the Director of Philanthropy at Crossroads of Western Iowa. We're so excited to present uh, this session this evening for Project HOPE. The session is How to Cope with COVID-19 Stress as an Essential Worker, Mitigating the Impact of Secondary Traumatic Stress, Job Burnout, and Empathetic Strain. Our speaker this evening that we are so delighted to have is Barbara Rubel. Barbara, uh, I'll go ahead and int introduce you. Barbara is a nationally recognized keynote speaker and trainer on vicarious trauma. Ms. Rubel's program motivates professionals to build professional resilience. Barbara has authored many books, including But I Didn't Say Goodbye, Helping Families After Suicide, and Loss, Grief, and Bereavement, Helping Individuals Cope. Her story was featured in the Emmy award-winning documentary, Fatal Mistakes. She received a bachelor's of science degree in psychology, a master's of arts degree in community health with a concentration in thanatology. And with that, I would like to welcome you, Barbara, and turn the time over to you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome to How to Cope, How to Cope During a Pandemic. How are you coping? It is so hard for so many of us. And for the next two hours, we're going to have the opportunity to talk about stress as an essential worker, but also I'm hoping to give you some tips on managing fear, worry, anxiety, uncertain distress, and Build your resilience. I'd like to start by sharing what happened to me in 1986. I was in the hospital and I was about to give birth to triplets when my husband told me that my father, a retired New York City police officer, used my mother's weapon because she too was a cop to end his life. And he killed himself while I was in the hospital going to give birth to three babies. I couldn't believe that my father would do such a thing. He was a loving father. He was a devoted husband. And he was very much looking forward to being a grandpa for the very first time. But he had deteriorating discs in his back and his suicide note said he couldn't take the pain any longer. But my dad's death propelled me into my career as a thanatologist because I needed to find meaning in his suicide. I needed to find meaning in his life. So many of us are dealing with losses, death-related losses, sudden death-related losses, and non-death-related losses, and making meaning, trying to find meaning in something so senseless. That was my life goal. So I wonder, if you were propelled into your job because perhaps of something that happened to you early in life. My specialty is thanatology. I am a specialist in loss, in death, in dying, in bereavement, in mourning. And people say, why it's so depressing. Why would you wanna do that? Well, because people die. And we mourn and we are bereaved and we have experienced so many losses. And so it takes an American death system to manage those non-death related losses and death related losses. What would happen if we didn't have that consolation after death? If we didn't have people to be there for us, to support us? With my father's suicide, I was in the hospital. I could not attend his funeral. I couldn't attend the wake. I couldn't be there because doctor's orders, I needed bed rest. And I was socially distant from everyone who was present for my dad, but I wasn't there. Just like with COVID right now, so many families aren't there for their loved ones as they're taking their last breath. They're not there for the funeral. We don't have that social consolation that we need. So I studied that etology to help people who are grieving all types of losses. But what propelled me into my career as a thanatologist pushed me even further because it was during the week of September 11th, 911, when I knew I could not hear one more story. 
I was working as a hospice bereavement coordinator. I was teaching at Brooklyn College. I was teaching a master's level class, crisis intervention. How do you teach crisis intervention during 911 in New York City? Well, it was the ride home from a support group that I had to also uh, facilitate that I realized oh, I can't, I can't take this. Everyone's dying, everyone's grieving. My whole world was, was I basically job burnout, secondary traumatic stress, compassion fatigue, vicarious trauma, empathic strain. But I had at the time, no idea what I was experiencing. I just thought I was stressed out. And I did so much to learn what I could about loss and grief. And I was in videos and I went back to school and I was a consultant and I learned what I could, but it's hard. It's hard working with the bereaved and it's hard knowing that we are living through this nightmare of a COVID-19 pandemic. It is hard to understand what we are experiencing. And so that's what brings us to the room today, that we will look at what is going on in our mind, in our body, and in our spirit, because something has shifted. So come with me now to module one, which is the introduction and program overview. Here's where we'll talk about the modules and the objectives of today's two hour webinar. Now you're here and you're watching the webinar and it has to be about you. I shared a little bit about myself, what brought me to this room, but what is a problem that you have right now that needs solving? What challenges are you facing in the workplace and at home? There are skills you need, but what results do you expect? What do you want? I'm hoping that in the two hours today that you will get some guidelines and maybe some tips to manage whatever it is you're experiencing. So we're in module one, we'll then move into module two. And here I'll give you a lot of tips from the research for essential workers to help you manage perhaps fear, anxiety, worry, and the distress that you might be experiencing. Then we'll move to module three, where I'll explain compassion fatigue, how it's made up of two elements, job burnout and secondary traumatic stress. Now, compassion fatigue, the term, the phrase is changing. Uh, we're going to start calling it empathic strain. And we'll also look at vicarious trauma. Then we'll explore in module four, fabulous techniques eight pillars of resilience to manage all the stress that's going on in your life. And then module five will close. You do have a participant manual. So I, I hope that you have downloaded it because you can actually, if you're the kind of learner where you wanna do while I'm speaking, you could fill out the self-assessments and the fill in the blanks and follow along during the two hours together. If not, you just wanna listen, and I invite you to download it after the program and work on it afterwards. So what are you getting out of this? Bottom line is you will develop eight pathways of self-care. Yes, we'll look at the strain and the stressors, but I want you to have these pathways to manage all the stress that you're going through and the loss as well and you will be able to put your character strengths into, into practice. That's the bottom line. If you know your strengths, and if at the end of this program, you could define eight strengths and know how to put them into practice to manage what you're going through, you'll be able to build your resilience. So let's look in module two at the tips to help you manage all the things that you're going through. Because we know what you are going through is hellacious. We are dealing with a pandemic, the severe outbreak, and we now know that it is an infectious respiratory disease and when it attaches to your lungs, it could be life-threatening. And as an essential worker, you are at risk, but you are at a higher risk if you have, uh, in, uh, let's say, chronic kidney disease, um, obesity, 
uh, type two diabetes. There are risk factors that increase your risk. And that is very frightening. So who is the essential worker? Who are we talking to today? Those who work in childcare, educators, especially schools that offer long distance learning, those who work in hospitals as orderlies, custodial staff, maintenance, and the stressors you might be experience could be, even though you're an essential worker, you may face a loss of employment, financial concerns, maybe you're not getting the social support that you need because of the isolation from people that you care about, your friends, your family. Uh, maybe you have stress because your kids are home, homeschooling, and you're trying to deal with all these pre-existing conditions in your own life. As an essential worker, you might work in a financial institution or, or be a home contractor, maybe a construction worker, work in a factory or on a farm, or perhaps you're in the news media. And no matter what type of job you have, the research keeps saying over and over again, physical isolation stress, economic stress, and your body has experienced the stress symptom or even the traumatic stress. It doesn't know what's going on. You've never experienced a pandemic before. You might be constantly checking for this infection, maybe um, afraid of your hand, oh, hand washing. I'm seeing that in the chat bar a lot in all of these webinars I'm doing. I've never washed my hands as much as I'm doing now. Even if I'm not going out, I'm still washing my hands. We have such fear. On top of that, you have everyone at home. Perhaps your spouse is home, your children, your parents, and you're doing the best you can, but you're managing everybody else's emotions as well. And then trying to do time management, helping the kids with their homework and getting dinner done or doing your chores, whatever it is you have to do around your house. But when was the last time you saw an older relative, an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent? Maybe you're worrying about them. So perhaps one of the things we can look at is mindfulness. There is so much research on being mindful to ease anxiety. And we all know during this pandemic, we are experiencing a greater risk of anxiety. So to be mindful, all you have to do is get comfortable in the moment, drop your, your jaw, your shoulders, and start breathing. You count your breaths, you inhale, you exhale. It is a slow process. And if your mind wanders, you bring it back to the mindfulness training of this exercise. It is about appreciating your breath. It's so simple because when we are stressed out and worried and filled with anxiety, we start to breathe really hard. And that gets in the way of our thinking and us moving in life. So other types of essential workers, well, perhaps you work in a, an adoption agency or you work with agent, aging or veterinary services, mental health agencies, home health care, nursing, hospitals, emergency dental. There are so many people who are out there as essential workers risking their lives to do their job. And in doing their job, that brings about fear. Now, fear, you know, is a defense mechanism. We all have fear because it helps us to survive a possibly threatening situation, but it is the most shared emotion during COVID-19. You are not alone in that fear response, but if you feel it too much, if you are constantly fearful, constantly washing your hands because you're so afraid you're going to become infected, that could lead to anxiety and worry. You might be fearful that if you get infected, you're going to die. Get infected, you may infect someone else in your family. You fear that someone else you love will become infected. Fear. And on top of fear, you might be dealing with anxiety. 
you're anxious because you haven't seen your friends and your family. You haven't seen your coworkers perhaps because of being socially distant. You're trying to support your family. You're doing the best you can with whatever economic adjustments are going on in your household. But we can put these anxious feelings into perspective. Are you spending too much time on the phone? Too much time with social media? Too much time on websites? If you spend too much time doing that, that can lead to more anxiety. So you have to look at the time you're spending and is that increasing your anxious feelings? Also, the studies show that you need to limit your news intake. Perhaps you have the television on all day. And so you are watching too much. If you are working, maybe you just have it on Saturday and Sunday or only in the evenings. It's too much. If you are going to listen to the news, make sure you stick to reliable news sources and try to limit all the negativity coming in through that media. Now, for stressors for healthcare and emergency workers who are essential workers, they are so fearful that they're going to spread the virus to infect their family and their close friends. And now what we're seeing is that although they, in the beginning, got so much encouragement now, what the studies are showing is they're also experiencing stigma and isolation because as an essential worker, you're out there in the public eye and you might become infected. So people are afraid of being too close to you. So what does that do to your thinking, to your feeling and the way you act? So to minimize the impact of isolation, try not to completely isolate yourself. Don't withdraw. You do have FaceTime and Skype and phone and text. You can reach out to others, your family, your friends, because you're not alone in this. It might feel like people are just being erased. They're, you, just, they're, you haven't seen them in months, maybe in a year. And it feels like, are they still my friend? How are they doing? Are they alive? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? It's hard. But again, what today, what I want you to know is that you are not in this alone. You are not alone. Whether you work in infrastructure, maybe utilities, public water and waste, airlines, transportation, taxis, uh, Uber, hotels, motels, Whatever your job is an essential worker, we appreciate what you are doing because you are putting your life on the line for us. And that is so appreciated, but it is so hard. So I wanted to share this one slide with you because it's really resonating in the chat bar. People are talking about how they are keeping contact with their friends who they haven't seen in months or a year. Several people are watching a movie at home, they may be alone, they're watching a movie, but they're watching it virtually with their friends. All their friends are watching the same movie. And then they will get on a Zoom or get on a telephone call or Skype and talk about that movie. Or they'll put it on pause at a certain point and share the movie so they really feel like they're together and they're all eating popcorn and having um, soda or a beer or whatever it is they're drinking together. So even though you're home and you're alone, you're not. You're socially, virtually socializing. Other things that people are doing are reading the same books as their friends or their, their relatives. And then they hold phone discussions. So they're all talking about the same topic because what was happening is that everyone was talking about the same topic, COVID-19. But this gives the opportunity to read a book together. And even though you're apart, you're really reading it together. Another thing that is really resonating with the essential workers in the chat bar is the exercise. So I love this particular study from Johns Hopkins, movies, reading, and exercising with your friends. So does that resonate in you? Now, other essential workers include people who work in manufacturing, 
food processing, medical equipment, household paper products. You see how many people are doing the essential work that we need, that we need to survive what's going on. And together we will get through this. However, what we will get through is the feeling of distress. What we will get through is the feeling of uncertainty distress. But what is it? What is uncertainty distress? It is coming up in the research over and over again because I'm, I'm bringing you a lot of research-based studies. Now we know that with a pandemic, you're going to feel stress and anxiety and depressive symptoms but you are also going to experience this thing called uncertainty distress. You just don't know when this pandemic will end. You do not know when your life can get back to, to normal. You do not know when you could take off that mask. You just don't know. And that uncertainty distress is very stressful. It's distressful in your body. And it comes along with sadness and guilt in this circumstance of COVID-19 that is absolutely abnormal. You've never experienced anything like this in your life. And because of that, you experience panic. Uncertainty, distress, and panic go hand in hand. Now, you know as well as I, we watched the news and saw all these people taking out food and toilet paper from supermarkets. And when I went food shopping, I saw the empty shelves and that scared me. That increased my own panic. Like I had to buy more toilet paper because there wasn't any, and that scared me. And when I went in the back of the store and saw that the shelves were empty on certain canned goods and cleaning product, that increased my uncertainty distress. Is this the way I'm going to live from now on? Did you ask those questions too? So what causes it? It's a prognosis of not knowing if you need to prepare for your loved one's death. It is information about this virus given by our authorities. We don't know what we don't know. Are we going to survive? And that uncertainty weighs heavily on our heart and mind. So at this point, in the webinar, I'd like you to go to the chat bar and answer this question. If you're experiencing uncertainty, distress, how are you dealing with it? Now, I really appreciate you responding and indicating in the chat bar how you're coping with uncertainty, distress, because there's not enough research on it. We are going through this for the very first time. So we are basically living the research so share how you are managing your uncertainty, distress and allow everyone else to learn from you. So thank you for answering that reflective question. And as you do that, I'll just move on. Now I mentioned several different types of essential workers, but of course you know that essential workers also work in retail, in our grocery stores, convenience stores, restaurant, takeout, delivery, I've never had so much takeout in my life. Uh, farmers markets, pet food stores. So what can we do as essential workers to manage the stressors, the uncertainty, going to work every day, putting our life on the line? Well, I love what the Department of Veterans Affairs said. Basically, Put sentences together that enhance your thinking, that help you reframe your thinking, keeping it positive. I'm doing the best I can to keep both myself and my family safe. I can control some decisions about my future. See, so you're making sentences into positive, not negative. It's affirmative. There are many things I can do, so I'll focus on those things instead of what's out of my control. And we all know there is so much out of our control. There have been setbacks in my life, but focusing on, on them only gets in the way of my, my priorities. And I have priorities and I'm gonna stick to my goals. And lastly, every setback in my life can be an opportunity to improve things that are going on in my life. So what are the services for essential workers that we need to be mindful of and appreciate that they're doing this work? 
food delivery, post offices, laundromats, auto repair, funeral homes. There are so many essential workers out there. And I, for one, really appreciate what they're doing. Now, as we talk about what essential workers need during this really difficult time, we can look at keeping up daily routines, make changes only when necessary, and don't completely isolate yourself. As again, what I mentioned throughout this webinar is about isolation. But keeping up daily routines. Now, I am a thanatologist, and I help many people after a suicide, homicide, car crash, death. My specialty is sudden death, although I did work as a hospice bereavement coordinator. And when we are grieving death-related losses, as well as non-death-related losses, and we are dealing with so many non-death-related losses, it's important to keep up daily routines. Simple routines, whether it's brushing your teeth, making your bed, or cleaning out a kitchen drawer, whatever it is that you do in your daily routine, keep that routine because it keeps yourself mindful that life is moving on, that you are okay. And that simple phrase, I'm doing okay, I'm doing the best I can. I'm going to manage this. I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to get through this really propels you to the other side of whatever it is this thing is. Now, other essential workers work in safety, law enforcement, fire, emergency management, defense contractors, private security guards. You see how many essential workers are out there doing their job. And all of them, all of what I've mentioned, they are so brave. They are so brave, but bravery is not the absence of fear because I have done this webinar for many essential workers and I see over and over again that they are fearful. They're fearful of being infected and they're fearful of bringing that infection home. But bravery is not the absence of fear or about doing foolish or risky things. It is a decision in the face of that fear, that sadness, that distress, that you do what's right and you do what's just. And bravery includes following the guidelines, wearing the masks, um, having thoughtful consideration of your behaviors when you are out to protect yourself and to protect others. I love what Winnie the Pooh said. You're braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. But the most important thing is, even if we're apart, I'll always be with you. So yes, as an essential worker, you are brave. I truly believe that. And I also believe that you are not alone in this, that even though you don't know the strangers out there, we are all rooting for you and we are all with you and we all appreciate you. So thank you. Thank you for your strength and thank you for your bravery. Others who work as essential workers, shelters, those who work in trash and recycling, exterminators, landscapers, attorneys. It is amazing as we review all these slides in this program, how many essential workers there are. And those essential workers, they go to work every day with a positive, positive attitude. And did you know that the research says that a positive attitude is the strongest protective factor against distress? uncertainty, distress, or any kind of distress. So a higher positive attitude is going to lower your distress levels. Isn't that great? So what would you say about your attitude? Is it positive? And are you an accountant, a car dealer? Do you work for UPS or FedEx, uh, marijuana dispensaries? It is unbelievable how many essential workers are out there with a positive attitude. They're coping. They're not allowing this negative situation to get them down. They feel value in what they're doing and they have a good quality of life. 
And I just hope they are ones who truly feel appreciated because those of us who are not essential workers really truly do appreciate them. What about those who work in retail? Pharmacies, gas stations, dry cleaners, office supply, computer stores, vendors of essential products. It's amazing. It is amazing that they're out there every single day during COVID-19 pandemic doing their job. It must be stressful. Studies show that stress comes from within, right? So it is not the actual circumstances that cause us to be stressed. It is the react, it is, is, it's not the circumstances, it is our reaction. It is, it is the feeling. It is that moment when you feel something. What is it? The stress response, the fight or flight. I was sitting on my deck having a cup of coffee. I look up into the tree and there's a raccoon. As Brian Tracy says, stress comes from within. It's your reaction to circumstances, not the circumstances themselves. How did I feel when I saw that raccoon? Stressed out. I thought he was going to kill me. Then I saw a Katie did. Next day after the rain and immediately got stressed out. And then I realized he's not going to hurt me. Stress comes from within. So how do you handle that stuff that's pop bubbling up from within? Are you sleeping too much? Are you doing too many drugs, binge shopping, marital issues, eating too much, alcohol, too much on social media that we talked about on before, phone use? Uh, maybe it's time to get professional help. There's telemedicine. You're not alone. You could reach out to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America or speak to your primary care physician to get help, to get mental help, to get physical help, to get the help you need. At this point in the webinar, I wanna focus on burnout and secondary traumatic stress and empathic strain. What is this phrase, empathic strain? Well, let's look at it in module three. For a very long time, the research called empathic strain, compassion fatigue. So that might be a phrase that you know. And basically compassion fatigue is when you're so empathetic, when you really identify with a person and then you're compassionate, you wanna help them. It's when they collide, that empathy and that compassion leads to the strain the compassion you give day after day, whether you're in a clinical setting or a first responder, you don't take care of yourself because you care so much for the other person, your client, your patient, that you don't have the strength. You're too exhausted to take care of yourself. And what Charles Figley said, it's the state of tension and preoccupation with the individual or cumulative, continuous, intense, stressful trauma of others. Does that resonate in you? Maybe you feel like you haven't done enough or you haven't worked through your own personal losses or you weren't trained. Too many cases or very difficult cases. You might be burning out. Anyone in any field can experience this work stress. And you know how you know you're burning out? When you start to feel cynical, just Cynical, it doesn't happen with like compassion fatigue with people or trauma or loss. Remember burnout can happen to anyone, but compassion fatigue, compassion fatigue is when you witness suffering. You can experience both job burnout and compassion fatigue, but how do you know you're experiencing burnout? Again, that emotional exhaustion you feel detached from other people, you just, your relationships are getting toxic and you just have no morale. And physically, you might be experiencing stomach aches and headaches, feeling frustrated, and just don't feel like you have any sense of accomplishment. So at this point in the webinar, I'd like you to go to the participant manual and go to burnout self-assessment. It looks like this. And there are 30 different statements. 
I have a Likert scale where you'll read the statement and then you'll go from agree strongly, agree somewhat, disagree somewhat and disagree strongly. So I've been experiencing more staff conflicts. I'm not engaged in the workplace. I work with people who are experiencing burnout. My supervisor does not create a sense of teamwork. There are 30 responses. So I invite you to go to your participant manual during the training or after to complete the worksheet. What might be contributing to your burnout? budgets, long shifts, personal risks, especially during COVID. Maybe you work with dangerous situations, your workload is absolutely unreasonable and you have a stressful job. Let's take a moment and look at this burnout test. It was given to people like yourself across the United States and they were asked to look at these two identical dolphins jumping out of the water. And if you see more than two to three differences between the identical dolphins, it shows that you are in fact burning out. So take a look at the photo on this particular PowerPoint slide. Do you see more than two differences between the dolphins? Now we all know that that's just a little funny little thing, but this is not. This is also from my favorite, Lewis Carroll. Who are you, said the caterpillar. I, I hardly know, sir, just at present, Alice replied rather shyly. At least I know who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have been changed several times since then. Do you ever feel like that? This really resonates in me because I work with people who are bereaved. I work with counselors and therapists and social workers who are listening to stories of sudden traumatic death, like homicide and suicide. And I am working with professionals who are experiencing job burnout, secondary traumatic stress, and empathic strain. So what is our quality of life like? What is our professional quality of life like? Dealing with all of that, do you ever feel hopeless? Are you overwhelmed? What about your belief system? Has that changed? Do you feel like your hard work has never made a difference? You are a certain person in this world with certain assumptions about who you are and how you walk in that. Maybe you're disconnected from the person you were meant to be. Let's look at five questions to ask yourself. Am I disconnected from myself, from my job? Do I wanna take off days from work? I never wanted to do that before. Is there a problem with my job performance? I've always done a good job. What's, what's happening? Would those I help rate me poorly? What is it about my affect, my attitude that they would even think to rate me poorly? And am I thinking of quitting? Ask yourself any of those questions. So imagine, if you met an older version of yourself right now during this webinar, what sage advice would they offer you? So think just for a moment. If you met someone, you, 20, 30 years in the future, what would they tell you? What sage advice would they offer? Here's another reflective question to go back into the chat bar. What is the major cause of burnout in those who work in your field? Now, I mentioned so many different types of essential workers. What about your field? Banking, nursing, education, fire, police. What is the major cause of burnout in those who work in your field? And answer that reflective question in the chat bar. And I wanna thank you for, for putting that in the chat bar because there's so much wisdom. We may not be in the same room, but we are in the same chat bar and we learn from each other. So thank you for doing that. Now that we looked at burnout, let's now focus in on secondary traumatic stress. Compassion fatigue is made up of both burnout and secondary traumatic stress. And usually it happens because of a mass trauma. The other individual or people or city or state or 
like the United States, experience the, the primary trauma. But we somehow experience that traumatic stress secondhand. And right now, there's no absolute definition for secondary traumatic stress. So I like to just say you're exposed or indirectly exposed to another person's trauma material. The grief, the trauma, the loss, the incident, whatever occurred happened to them, but you are indirectly exposed. And what happens to you mimics post-traumatic stress disorder. What contributes to your experiencing secondary traumatic stress? Whether you listen to tapes or read documents, repeated exposure to trauma, high empathy level, personal traumatic memories, recalling your own past traumas, not having enough training, and that listening and reading documents, many people who work in the court system, listening to 911 calls, uh, there are just so many ways to absorb that secondhand material. And you may feel intrusion, you may feel avoidance, and you may feel arousal. These are the three symptoms. Your heart may pound, you may avoid work, being around people who remind you of work, um, anxieties increase, you might just feel this jumpiness, it affects you. Here's another reflective question. What is the major cause of your secondary traumatic stress? You could put that in the chat bar as well. What is the major cause of your secondary traumatic stress? Remember the other person or persons experience the primary trauma, but somehow you feel it. Another phrase I wanna to bring to your attention is called vicarious trauma. So we talked about burnout and secondary traumatic stress and compassion fatigue and empathic strain. Vicarious trauma is very similar symptoms to secondary traumatic stress. That's prolonged engagement with victims of trauma, vicarious trauma. So think about the phrase, the other person is traumatized, yet you are vicariously traumatized by the details of their crime, their loss, their event, their tragedy. What contributes to it? The exposure to trauma. I recently did a presentation for court coordinators and they said they never go in the court. They never see the victim. They're never there. Yet they read the documents and they are experiencing vicarious trauma just by reading the documents for the judges and the magistrates. And there's no work variations in that in their tasks. Who has a higher incident rate of getting vicarious trauma? newer employees and those less experienced, right? Makes sense. Or they lack supportive processing to discuss the traumatic content. They need to talk about the story, the lost narrative, the incident. They need to debrief. And that's really, really important. So the secondary traumatic symptoms are very similar to the vicarious trauma symptoms, as I noted problem sleeping, aggression, this imagery that pops up in your head, especially three o'clock in the morning when you're sleeping and all of a sudden you're thinking of their trauma or being forgetful, boundary issues, problems with intimacy, definitely greater sensitivity to the violence. But here's what's different with vicarious trauma. And although this is from the research, I'll share anecdotally, this is what I hear from those victim advocates, from those individuals who work with victims of crime. The way they look at the world shifts. They have a certain purpose in the world and it shifts their worldview. The world is no longer a safe place and they don't feel safe anymore. There's a profound shift in their sense of safety and they have negative cognitive changes. With vicarious trauma, how it's different than secondary traumatic stress is it really affects the way you think, the way you think about who you are, your identity, what you value, 
your belief system. Now, secondary traumatic stress, it, it mimics post-traumatic stress disorder. You feel numb. Um, it, it, it's usually short in duration, but vicarious trauma, that can stay with you and it can stay with you a long time. Because like we talked about, the view of self changes, your safety, trust, esteem, intimacy, control, everything about your worldview shifts. You know, that's scary. And that's why I created the fabulous principle. It's fabulous techniques to cope with COVID-19 stress. Now for years, I focused on this framework, the fabulous framework to help professionals manage their secondary traumatic stress, compassion fatigue, and vicarious trauma. It's only in the past year that we're now focusing in on COVID-19. So whether you are trying to manage the stressors and uncertainty distress of COVID-19, or you simply want to build your resilience as an essential worker, I'm glad that you are here because you are resilient. Spending two hours at the end of a long day on a webinar to build your resilience shows that you are resilient. Otherwise you would just be sitting around watching TV. So what is resilience? I like to say it's a skillful way to bounce back after stressful workplace challenges. And you are facing workplace challenges unlike anyone else anyone else. This is about your resilience. It's about how you overcome the adversity that you dealt with today, that you keep that positive attitude. It's the idea of your well-being. But there'll be a lot of new circumstances and some of those circumstances will not be good, but you'll bounce back because you're either very resilient or you want to build your resilience. To build your resilience, you have to know what your resources are. So what are your positive coping skills? What would you say they are? How do you put your strengths, and you have strengths, how do you put them into practice? And how do you manage moral distress when you do things that you fundamentally disagree with and go against your values? Now, I wrote a course book for nurses. It's coming out next month on COVID-19, loss, grief, and bereavement. And what I see in the research over and over again is the moral distress that nurses and frontline workers are experiencing because they're doing things that go against their values because they don't have enough time or they don't have enough PPP or they don't, they don't have enough of what they need to do their job the way they want to do it. It is hard, but your personal resources will build your resilience. And what studies show is that most of us will grow from this experience. Most of us will either experience personal growth or post-traumatic growth. If you are less resilient, you'll experience post-traumatic growth. It's so interesting that we have the ability to address the stress and hardships, that we can do it. And that's why I created the fabulous principle. This framework is going to help you that whatever losses you're experiencing, whether they are death related losses, and if you did lose someone because of a COVID-19 related death, I am so sorry. I truly am so sorry. If you are here because of non-death related losses, we are still experience loss and that loss can perhaps bring about positive change and growth in our lives and, and transform us. And looking at our current challenges, that we can be okay, that we will be okay because we have these strengths that will help us get through it. We have the ability. So what are these strengths? F is for cognitive flexibility to reframe the way you think about things. A is about attitude, having a positive attitude in spite of all the negativity going around us. B is for boundaries, maintaining your boundaries when they are pushed. 
boundary violations. Not healthy. You is about understanding job compassion, understanding satis compassion satisfaction, understanding the satisfaction that you get from doing the job that you are doing. L is for laughter. It's about keeping a sense of humor in spite of all the negativity going around us. O is for optimism. How optimistic are you? Or are you more pessimistic than ever? U is about being united, being connected, whether it's your faith community or your dog, whatever, whatever it is, you need connections. And lastly, S is for self-compassion. That's about being kind to yourself. Are you kind to yourself? Or are you too busy being kind to everybody else? Let's look at the first pillar, which is the foundation of the fabulous principle. It is about your mindset, flexibility, mental agility that gives you the ability to bounce back because of the way that you think. Now, you know your thoughts better than anyone. Your thoughts can be logical, they can be exaggerated, but thoughts can happen automatically. So what I invite you to think about is when that thought pops up in your head, that negative thought, that thought that says you're doing a terrible job, that you're no good, whatever that negative thought is, reframe it, frame it into a positive thought and know that your thoughts are based on your core values and what's important to you. So always go back to that. In the worst of times when your thinking is very negative, just go back to your belief about what you think about yourself, your world, and is it a good place? Is it a place where you know you can survive because of something or someone? It's about a belief in yourself. It's about thinking about you in this world. So here are seven tips if your thoughts are increasing your negative feelings. Brainstorm positive behaviors to deal with each problem. That means when you have a problem, think about all these different ways of dealing with it in a positive way rather than a negative way. Be alert to that critical thought and change it immediately. When it pops in your head, when that automatic critical thought says you're doing poorly or whatever, reframe it into a positive thought and reframe those negative thoughts into positive ones while not focusing on that one bad thing that happened instead of all the good things. At the end of the day, maybe you did have one screw up, but what about all the good things that you accomplished? Also, look at your knee-jerk reactions to avoid certain behaviors. Sometimes you just react in the negative. It's just the way you've always react. So work on pulling back on that and let go of preconceived notions and biases about the world and adjust your thinking to accept new knowledge. Our brain can continually learn. So allow it to accept new knowledge and learn. And remember, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. You can have a new mindset. And that new mindset can bring about new results. So ask yourself, do I want new results? Do I want to think differently? Can I have a flexible mindset? Well, how can I do that? At this point in the webinar, I want you to go to your participant manual. It looks like this. You'll see 50 different strengths on your page number six. And I'd like you to look at all of those strengths and then figure out what strength can I choose? And after I choose that strength to create a flexible mindset, how can I put it into practice? So you might say, I'm open-minded. I notice a negative thought and I try to reframe it into a positive one. Other ones on here, punctual, mature, spiritual, vitality, fairness, any of these strengths resonate in you? Relaxed, patient, bravery. These are all different strengths that when you 
take the strength and put it into practice will help you to be flexible. So if you do that, what happens? It's going to build your resiliency. Now let's look at pillar two, which is attitude. Attitude in all the research says that it is a tool to overcoming the stressful demands of your, not only professional life, but your personal life as well. So use this attitude as a tool because your perception about the world, your job, your friends, your family influences how you think, behave and, and feel, right? It guides your state of mind about the work that you do. Attitude, you can choose to have a positive attitude or you can choose to have a negative attitude. So what is it? So the attitude is about your beliefs, about the way you're going to manage whatever situation you're going through. And that's gonna be reflected in the way you act. And the way you act is based on all your life circumstances, your learned behaviors and your attitude. It can be positive, it can be negative, it can be neutral, it can be mixed. But what is your attitude about taking care of yourself? What is your attitude about self-discipline and self-awareness? about balancing your life and your work and loss. You can choose a positive outlook. Now, as I was looking at the research this week, I did several webinars and there just popped up uh, so many articles now, studies being done on exercise and how exercise is building resilience. So, What's your outlook? What's your attitude about exercise being that the studies are showing it increases your psychological well being and it decreases your job stress? I'm finding that very interesting. I do belong to a gym, so maybe this week I will get there. Here's five appreciative questions to ask yourself. I always like asking questions in the positive and try to stay away from the negative. So, what is working well for you? What's been helpful? How am I overcoming the challenges I'm facing? What's important in my life? What's the most re rewarding part of my life? This is to go inward and ask yourself these appreciative questions to propel you to build your resilience. Because some of us are thinking we have this ball of yarn in our head and it's just all over the place. But sometimes talking to a friend, someone in, in the clergy, speaking to your supervisor, supervision, a family member, speaking to someone sometimes takes that ball of yarn and helps you really create a ball that's powerful, that makes you understand your attitude because attitude is everything. So pick a good one. I also wanna share about gratitude. There's so much research now on attitude of gratitude, this emotional state that reinforces our connections. It helps us want to be with other people and it increases our life satisfaction. It also reduces the stress in our life and it boosts happiness. During one of my trainings, uh, someone in the chat bar, she indicated that she created a, a gratitude jar. Uh, she was a nurse working with COVID patients and she came home and she wrote on a piece of paper what she's grateful for. And then she put that little piece of paper into the jar. And I read in the research last year how other people use their gratitude jar. And I think it's such a fabulous idea to just take a jar. You know, you just made spaghetti, clean out the jar, take a piece of paper and every day just throw things in the jar about what you are grateful for. I tell you, when my father died by suicide, I could not attend his funeral and Honestly, it broke my heart, but my mom, she was 91 years old and she was on hospice and I was able to say goodbye to her. That day I was filled with gratitude. This is her funeral. And I am so grateful to be standing 
at her casket. She had several police officers present. They carried her casket to the burial site. She had several people from the armed forces because she was a whack in the army. And on that day, my son Alan was going into the army and they folded the flag and they handed the flag to my son. And it was Mother's Day. And on the saddest day of my life, with my mother's casket being put into the ground and my son, my firstborn of the triplets going off to the army, I was filled with gratitude. Even in the worst of times, we can find something in our lives to be grateful for. At this point, I'd like you to go to the chat bar and share with those in the webinar, what are you grateful for? At this moment in our lives, living through a pandemic, what are you grateful for? Ability is what you're capable of doing. Motivation determines what you do. Attitude determines how well you do it. My son, Michael, lives in Florida and he has a French bulldog, Toby, my first grandson. And I hate the heat, but I go to Florida and I sweat as I'm walking. The humidity is horrible and I don't have a very good attitude, I have to be honest. But I'm walking this dog and people stop me. Oh, he's so cute. Or what kind of dog is that? Oh, I love his smile and look at that chain. And I find that walking the dog actually shifts my attitude from negative to positive. So what shifts your negative to a positive? What causes a bad attitude? Maybe your boss isn't listening to your complaints. Maybe you don't feel appreciated. You're overworked, too much pressure, or you're bringing your personal problems to the workplace. It's very hard not to bring your personal problems to the workplace because you're human. And I am a keynote speaker. And at this point in my program, I actually ask those in attendance, how many humans are in the room? And there could be like 500 people and only about 20 will raise your hands. And I'm always curious, if you're not human, what are you? Well, anyway, we don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. We come to our jobs. We come to our community based on our lifetime of losses and our lifetime of happy moments and our experiences. We come with our thinking and our attitude. Well, I was at Grants for Sculpture. I live in New Jersey and it's a place in New Jersey that you can walk around and see these life-size, beautiful different sculptures. And I was walking with a friend and I saw the sculpture and I said to her, oh, look, they must be grieving a loss of a child, maybe a, a husband and wife holding each other. And she said, what's wrong with you? They're, they're lovers. Look at the sign, lovers in a clandestine wood. Like I even think that statues are grieving because of my world. All I do is I, I work with those who are bereaved. I teach people who, who are professionals about traumatic loss. I, I work with and teach and educate professionals who are dealing with vicarious trauma because of the trauma and the grief that they work with every single day. It's my world. So I even think statues are grieving. I just think that's so funny. Oh, we are who we are. At this point in the webinar, I'd like you to go back to the training manual and look at worksheet 4-1, attitude. As I said before, there are many strengths. So to choose a positive attitude, you might say I'm tactful, I'm honest, social, firm, playful, hopeful, happy, creative, integrity, organized. You see how many 
different strengths that you could choose from. So think of a strength that when you put it into practice, helps you keep a good attitude, right? So maybe you might say, I'm brave. Even when others feel differently, I speak up for what's right. I do many trainings for victim advocates. And I would say nine out of 10 choose bravery because they have to work with the prosecutor's office and for the victim. So what would you choose as an essential worker? What strength when put into practice, it helps you have a positive attitude with the overall goal of building your personal resilience. So at this point, I'd like to move along to pillar three, boundaries, boundary violations. And there are plenty, legal, relationships, material, emotional, sexual, intellectual, physical, time. There are so many ways to push those boundaries. Do you allow people to push your boundaries? Have you ever violated your boundaries? What happens if the gingerbread cookie lingers in a cup of hot chocolate? Even doing things that might feel good could lead to your melting. Soft boundaries where you're easily manipulated, rigid boundaries where there's no exception or bendable boundaries that are ideal. Put your strengths into practice to keep your boundaries. You can also now go to worksheet 4-2 if you have the participant manual. And on worksheet 4-2, you'll see different phrases or statements that help you maintain your appropriate boundaries. And you can work on this because there's a, a big section for you to indicate how you kept your boundaries. Um, what terms did you use? I have the phrase right here. Did I use a term of endearment? Did I offer to give a person I was helping a ride home? Did I spend more time with this person than I usually spend? It's very important for you to look over that list and figure out what boundaries you are pushing or violating because you teach people how to treat you by what you allow, what you stop, and what you reinforce. Now, on worksheet 4-3, I, like I said, I do a lot of trainings with uh, DIFUS and, and those who work with Child Protective Services and victim advocates. And I put together from that training, this is not research-based, but I, I went around the room and I broke up all the groups from several trainings. And I, I asked them to create a question after they meet with a client or a victim or a patient, what question would ensure them that they stayed within a professional boundary during that time when they were with that person? And these are the ones I got 40. I originally had about 800 on this list. Was I unbiased? Did I say too much? Did I listen to my gut? Did I make a person I was helping feel less safe after speaking with them? Did I give a client preferred or special treatment after hours? Did I offer the person I was helping more information that was necessary? Did I explain the reasons why I was asking all the questions? Did I continue contact with the adult client after the case was closed? There are 40 questions on here, again, not based in research, but based in the, um, the trainings that I've done. Uh, I find that the research is great, but attendees of these programs. They're in the trenches. They know what's going on and we can learn a lot from them. Jesse Dorman said, problems arise and that one has to find a balance between what people need from you and what you need for yourself. So what do you need? What do you need right now? We're spending two hours together talking about stressors and uncertainty to stress and burnout and vicarious trauma and now building our resilience, but what do you need? What do you need in your life? And what are you gonna to do to make it happen? With that said, let's go back to worksheet 4-1 and identify the boundary strength. What strength would you say that when you put it into practice, 
It helps you to maintain your boundaries, which helps you build your resilience. You might say, prudence, I know my organizational policy. That one keeps coming up a lot. I know my policy and procedure manual. I've read it. I know what's expected of me. I do my job. And that helps me stay within boundaries. But on this sheet, 4-1 on page six, you'll see other strengths. Reflective, authentic, passionate, humorous, generous, outgoing, leadership, kindness, empathetic, gratitude. Any of those resonate in you? find it so interesting that there are hundreds of strengths and some of us, we don't even know what they are. Now let's focus on pillar four, understanding job satisfaction and compassion satisfaction. That is all about the fulfillment you get doing your job. You are satisfied with your job. Why are you satisfied? Because it fits just like a puzzle piece. You know your job description. You know what you're responsible for. It fits with who you are. It fits with your needs. You have a trusted leader. You got good working conditions. You're paid well, good culture in your organization. So again, the puzzle piece fills and you're accomplishing your goals. Your supervisor is allowing you to make decisions, uh, perhaps offering um, education, skills. Everything that you're doing makes a difference. And so that would make, that's what makes you understand job satisfaction. So are you satisfied with your role as an essential worker? Are you in the appropriate workplace or the right industry? Do you have the right strengths for your job? And are you paid as much as your peers? You need a positive work environment. You need to be recognized. Your supervisor needs to show you appreciation because the higher job satisfaction you have, the lower compassion fatigue you will have. So let's just go back. Are you accomplishing your goals? Yes or no? Is your work, what you're doing, making a difference in the world? Do you have a leader that you trust? And do they show appreciation? Because studies show people don't leave the company. They don't leave their agency. They don't leave their system or organization. They leave their manager. So job satisfaction, attitude. It is affected by the type of job you do, by how much authority you have, by how much money you make, welfare, work skills. It is, it is about your attitude. Now the wise old owl who's looking at you right now, what would he say? about your attitude. Understanding compassion satisfaction. It's the fulfillment you get from providing care to others. And remember, compassion fatigue predicts lower compassion satisfaction. So think about how much satisfaction you're getting from the job that you're doing. Are you getting any pleasure from the job that you're doing? Do you feel grateful for being kind to other people? Do you feel positive about your coworkers? What do you feel about contributing to the greater good? Or do you have a meaning in life? I did a presentation not too long ago where they brought in a Tibetan monk and he created this Mandela outside the room. And he felt such satisfaction in this job in the level of compassion he was giving to all of the attendees. And he was very mindful, as we talked about in the very beginning of this webinar, the being in the moment, the attention to, to detail, non-judgmentally, just accepting and not being overwhelmed and breathing into the good of what he was doing. Oh, several years ago as a hospice bereavement coordinator, I sat at the bedside of someone who was actively dying. 
And the husband said, help me say goodbye to her. I don't know how to say goodbye. I've married to her for so many years. Help me say goodbye. And in that moment, I felt compassion, satisfaction. I was with the patient who was terminally ill, taking her last breath. And I knew what to say to this man as he said goodbye to the woman that he loved for so many years. That's compassion, satisfaction. Understanding our job satisfaction, understanding our, our, our experience that we just will do the best we can with what we have and maybe experience personal growth, maybe experience post-traumatic growth, maybe we'll be able to build our resilience if we learn some skills and identify our strengths and recognize that so many of us are in fact dealing with non-death related losses and grieve those losses. Grief is a palette of grief, emotional, cognitive, behavioral, physical, spiritual, and you become bereaved because you've lost something. It doesn't have to be a death. You've lost something someone, something, and you mourn, and you're not the same. So perhaps even with all that negatives around us, that we can still grow from the experience. We can still experience some post-traumatic growth. This change as a result of this highly challenging life circumstance that's going on in your life. It's different for every single person. Has it brought you to a place to appreciate your life? What about the compassion you have for other people? Or now maybe you're focusing on new possibilities because you realize life, how long do we have? Maybe you could find meaning in what you are personally going through. Are you finding meaning in whatever is going on in your life, your narrative, your story? Now, when we look as a thanatologist, when I look at meaning making, I'm looking at how a bereaved person takes that loss narrative and finds meaning in what happened. But we can look at ways of making meaning and promoting it into a, a healthy mental health experience for us. So if you experienced a death due to COVID, then you might apply this differently. But if you did not experience a death-related loss, you're just focusing in on just all the non-death-related losses and all the changes in your life. How are you finding meaning in being an essential worker? You might say, I value life. I don't take life for granted. Or I live life to the fullest. I'm taking advantage of time. Or personal growth. I have greater strength. Impermanence, life is short and there's no guarantees. Or lifestyle changes, I drink less. Now, Jilly's and Associates back in 2014 created this loss code book, meaning in loss code book that was to be applied to those who were bereaved. But I know and truly believe that we can apply this in our own lives as we find meaning in our roles, in our job, find meaning in the non-death related losses and meaning in our own experience. Perhaps you might say, I'm finding meaning in what's going on in my life because my family means more to me now than ever. Or you might say, I appreciate my friends and the social support I'm getting, or I wanna help others. You might say, I'm dealing with it and I'm doing the best I can. Or lastly, you might say you have a greater perspective. I'm not upset by the small stuff or little things. Here's a reflective question to go back to the chat bar. How have you made meaning in your role as an essential worker? So I appreciate your, your sharing that with us because how you made meaning, we can learn from that and grow from that. So thank you for filling out the chat bar. At this point, we'll do exactly what we did with the other worksheets, 4-1, understanding job satisfaction. Here, 
you'll choose a strength. And then how does putting that strength into practice help you understand why you're satisfied as an essential worker? You might say, I'm skillful, I know how to communicate. But here are some more strengths. Open-minded, perseverant, dependable, determined, disciplined, resourceful, hardworking, cooperative, self-regulation, social intelligence, love of learning, intelligent, perfectionist. There are so many strengths to go through. Choose a strength. Put it into practice to understand job satisfaction, to understand why you do what you do and build your personal resilience. At this point, we go to pillar five, laughter. Having a sense of humor. So there's stand up, you know, that's comics and people who tell jokes. I love that. Slapstick, physical comedy. There's sarcastic humor, that's dark comedy. Gallows humor, uh, many people in the hospital set, setting um, have gallows humor, grim misfortune. Observational humor, it's not planned. Um, as a keynote speaker, I'll tell you that observational uh, is very much, uh, as well as self-defeating, where you poke fun at yourself, because I've fallen going up the steps onto one of those, those big stages. Um, uh, Stuff goes wrong, PowerPoints fade in the background. So having a sense of humor in life really does help. Let's go back to the chat bar. And what is the type of humor you most rely on to manage your stress? Put it in the chat bar. Would you say stand up, slapstick, sarcastic, gallows, observational, or self-defeating humor? and indicate that in the chat bar. And after today's webinar, um, I will get the chat bar and I really enjoy reading the responses. So thank you for taking the time to do that. It is important to incorporate a few minutes of fun in your day. Do you, do you just, you know, maybe bring in donuts for your, for coworkers, a five minute exercise break. Do, I, I love what I'm hearing more and more in the chat bar this year is that they're bringing in therapy dogs or they have therapy dogs in the, in the parking lots. I mean, I, I love that idea. So try to incorporate fun into your day. Also affirmations, love affirmations. Years ago, Stuart Smalley was a character on Saturday Night Live. And he said, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. So let's do this together. I know you're in front of a screen, maybe your spouse is in the other room, you have kids in another room, your friends next to you, watching TV, whatever. But let's do this out loud together. Ready? I'm good enough. I'm smart enough and doggone it, people like me. See, now it might have just put a stupid smile on your face. So if, if it did, then my job is done. It is so important to not take yourself too seriously. I was doing a keynote address um, in New Jersey on compassion fatigue in school nurses. It was about 15 years ago. There were over a thousand school nurses. It was the National Association of School Nurses. And, oh no, it wasn't, it wasn't in New Jersey. It was Washington, DC. I apologize. I'm from New Jersey. And I told everyone in attendance how important it was to go home and decompose. I said the word decompose. And I couldn't understand why a thousand people are laughing at me. Because in my mind, I'm saying decompress. Finally, thank God for this nurse. She came up to the front of the room. There were two um, microphones on both sides. And she came up and she said, uh, Barbara, uh, you're telling us to decompose. And I was like, no way. So I needed a sense of humor. Also bringing home triplets, believe me, if anyone needs a sense of humor, when you bring home three baby boys from the hospital, yeah, uh, you need a sense of humor. 
Now let's do exactly what we've done throughout this training. Let's look at worksheet 4-1 and choose a strength from the 50 that are listed for laughter. And think about how you put that strength into practice to maintain a sense of humor. So what do I have here on the list? Faith, loyal, gentle, proud, zest, daring, quiet, love, eager, calm, funny. Wow, there are so many different ones on here to choose from. But let's say you choose zest. I start each day with a sense of excitement. Now, because I've been doing so many webinars, I've been constantly going back and looking at the research on humor and playfulness and just coping with COVID-19 related loss. And zest is popping up more and more in the research. So if you chose zest, I would recommend that you read more about it because it really is a great way to build your resilience. Now we move to pillar six of the fabulous principle, and it's about being optimistic. And absolutely all the research indicates that it will absolutely influence your well being, your physical well being, and your mental well being. Now, optimism, it's an attitude, it's a personality trait, and it influences how you cope. And it is a protective fa factor against stress. Now, optimists, they are ones who focus on life goals. Pessimists, um, it, it, if you're not optimistic, you're, you're basically life goals are impaired. So it's better to focus in on being optimistic than being pessimistic. So just think about that. So, also, being a realistic optimist, not a Pollyanna. You have to realize, you know, it, it be realistic. Anticipate what's going to happen. Anticipate the best possible outcome. Use active coping strategies that indirectly influence your life and believe others really want to be your friend. The research shows that if you believe that you're an optimist, then you believe that people want to be your friend. So use your coping strategies, anticipate the best possible outcome, and be a realistic optimist. Optimists choose healthier behavior. And so the research indicates that you live longer than pessimists. If you know that, then of course you want to be an optimist. So how would an optimist describe their job and how would that be different than how a pessimist describe, describe their job? An optimist will say, my job as an essential worker is rewarding, it's fulfilling, it's gratifying. A pessimist will say, it's wounding, it's exhausting, it's draining. So here's this cat on the field. Do you think he gets hit in the head? If you think he gets hit in the head, then are you an optimist or a pessimist? You're a pessimist, right? So do you think he gets hit? The optimist cat will say it's the player's fault for playing so close. The pessimist cat will say, I am so getting hit in the head. I love this cartoon. Oh, great. Just when I've cleaned up from the earthquake. Oh, just when I cleaned up from the earthquake. Oh my God, look at this. That's what our life is like. It's one thing after the other, but if you are an optimist, you'll be able to deal with it. You can't control the unexpected, but you can control your responses to it. Just like in the beginning of this webinar, when I saw that raccoon in the tree and the Katie did, how I got that stress response, I can't control what's going on around me, but I can't control my response. Now let's do exactly what we've been doing. Go back to worksheet 4-1. We're talking about optimism, choose a strength, and think about how you put that strength into practice to be optimistic. You might say, I'm hopeful. I anticipate the best possible outcome. Here's some more that are on this list. Enthusiastic, approachable, wise, 
humility, humble, motivated, amazing amount of strengths that you can choose from. And at the end of today's webinar, I hope that you choose eight strengths that you put them into practice, that you apply them to the eight pillars of the fabulous principle and build your resilience as an essential worker. At this point, let's look at pillar seven, be united. That's the feeling you get when you belong to a group, when you're close to certain people. It is about getting the social support that you need. It's feeling basically satisfied with your life because of the people that are in your life. And if your leader treats you fairly, if you really feel a bond that's a compassionate leadership, then you'll find your job to be meaningful. So is your leader a role model to you? Does your leader promote wellness? Is he or she protecting training budgets? debriefing cases, offering flexible hours. Think about all the things that you want your leader to be. Are they praising you for, for your contribution every single day? Well, not that they're praising you every single day, but you're working every single day. And do they say, thank you, good job, well done. Do they dwell on your success and not your fa failures? Do they offer stay interviews instead of exit interviews? Perhaps once or twice a year, bring you into their office and say what's going right, not what's going wrong, and offer mentoring programs. Now, some organizations, because of COVID-19, they have to modify their policies and adjust their workplaces, but they must show appreciation. That is so important and encourage online training so you feel like you're getting what you need. Oh, we are so traumatized by what's going on. And so I really recommend that you seek out the EAP if it's available or you seek out maybe mental health care or you go online and read what you can that's going to help you cope with your very stressful experience. We need relationships and we value the relationships we have in our community, but we're not allowed to be a part of that physically. So perhaps you can look into your community and see what's going on online. It's about having relationships. Now think for a moment about the relationships you have on the job. What if you worked with one person and your job was to sit in this vehicle and go down the highway and paint one white line down the highway and you come across a tree? You are the kind of person that perhaps would get out of the vehicle, move the tree, get back in the vehicle and paint a white line. What if you worked with everyone else or especially this person and they would go around the tree or they would go over the tree. When your values don't match, sometimes you just don't like the people that you work with because some people are real, some people are good, some people are fake and some people are real good at being fake. And that's why we need our friends because friends accept you the way you are. We need our friends. We also need our family. My sons were born together and here's their baby picture. And I put it here because I think they're just like little monkeys. They hear no evil, speak no evil and see no evil. And I think that these little guys, these triplets can teach us much about what's going on right now with COVID-19. Don't listen to people that are negative that are people sharing things with you, saying things that are bothering you. Stick to the positive people in your life. Surround yourself with good things, the things that, that make you happy. And create that, that awe environment. It's an amazing thing. What the research shows is that you might be sitting outside and looking up at the clouds or the mountains or a stream or whatever you're looking at, and you realize that you are not alone in COVID-19. You are not alone. And you could 
focus on the fact that other people are experiencing this too. And there are things out there beyond yourself. You're listening to music. Other people are listening to, to music. You know, you, you're connected to something, to something bigger, bigger than yourself. It's about being a rock to each other. It's about finding what is important in your life. When my triplets were three, I got pregnant again and I brought home Brian and you see how stressful his life was. He has three older brothers wanting to play rough with him, but they're doing well now. What about your family? What about your best friend? What about your dog, your cat? Who is your rock? Who is your rock? Who is that, that person or maybe um, spiritual guide or God or whatever? Who is your rock that's helping you get through this? We spent almost two hours together trying to build your resilience to cope with the stressors that are going on in this pandemic. Who is your rock in helping you deal with it? So if you could put that in the reflection, in the chat bar, that would be so appreciated. And I really look forward to, to reading that after uh, today's webinar. So who is your rock? And like we did with all the others, go back to worksheet 4-1, choose a strength. How did you put it into practice to be connected with others? You might say, I'm collaborative. I'm loyal to my team. And again, there are so many ones on here to choose from, like devoted, restrained, trusting, energetic, agreeable. I have 50 strengths here, but there are hundreds of strengths to, to look at, to, to bring into your world, to write on a list and, and utilize them in your life so you can cope with what's going on. Let's look at pillar eight, self-compassion, being kind to yourself, keeping things in balance when you fail, that you're not alone, others fail too, to remain positive, even when things go wrong, be kind and understanding. Don't be judgmental that you make mistakes. Other people make mistakes too. Don't isolate yourself in that, in that suffering and be mindful by keeping the experience in perspective rather than exaggerating it. Those are the elements that we need to look at and to look at your traits that, that help you adaptively cope, that keep you going, make you persistent. Be self-compassionate. Take the breaks throughout the day. Oh, take a breath. Be spiritual. Do whatever it is you can. Check in with yourself. How often do you check in with yourself to assess how you're feeling after a difficult moment or a difficult day? Would you say never, rarely, sometimes, all the time? How do you check in? Do you check in? So maybe now you will check in. And it's about connecting to your body, breathing exercises, getting more sleep, drinking tea, Tai Chi, Whatever it is, it's going to help you turn off that maladaptive, that stress response, that switch. Find what works for you. Now, here are 10 strategies to manage stress that I have put together for the past, I'd say, two, maybe three years in my trainings. This is what keeps coming up the most. Prayer, family, friends, exercise, being creative reading, being with nature, um, especially gardening, that keeps coming up a lot, yoga, mindfulness training, and volunteering. Isn't that great? So maybe you choose one of them. And now the last time you're going to go to worksheet 4-1 for self-compassion, choose a strength. How do you put it into practice to be self-compassion? And you might say, I'm gentle. I treat myself kindly when things go wrong. Here's another really good, really good reflective question. Put this in the chat because out of all of today's questions, I, I can't wait to see what your greatest strength is. What is your greatest strength? We indicated eight today, but indicate one that you feel is your greatest strength in the chat bar. 
And as you do that, I want you to be mindful that your greatest strength could be your worst weakness. What if you're too helpful? What if you're too daring? What if you're too hardworking, right? Your strength could become your weakness. You might even have blind spots, unrecognized weekend, weak, um, weaknesses, or, or you fail to see yourself as other people see you. During today's training, I really realized that we are all living through COVID-19. I'm living through it. We are the case study. We are the case study. And when I was in Sedona, I realized that I was in this place, that's me in the photo, in the same place as the, the postcard. And it seems now we're all in the postcard. We are the case study. So what resonates in you when you think about the stories that you hear. What's the best way to support each other so we don't deal with this empathic strain? And, and how are we going to deal with the secondary trauma by listening to the stories? After today's webinar, I'd like you to go to the participant manual and look at worksheet 4-4, a self-care plan to let go of work. And this will take you about an hour to complete. And I've done this workshop um, a lot in the past two weeks, especially. And I am loving that people are emailing me at barbarubel at barbarubel.com and sharing their self-care plan with me. They're sharing their goal, the reasons to accomplish the goal, their resources, the value of doing it. And I, I thank them. And I thank you if you want to send me your self-care plan as well. But remember, a goal without a plan, it's just a wish. At this point in today's webinar, we're going to wrap up with module five. And this is where you get to ask questions and evaluate your level of learning. What are the takeaways? Well, we had four objectives to identify the contributors to empathic strain, burnout, secondary trauma. And also we talked about vicarious trauma a little bit. Uh, we reviewed ways to cope with the stressors. Uh, we looked at the eight pillars of resilience with the fabulous principle and how to put our character strengths into practice. It is about turning knowledge into action. So are you going to turn knowledge into action? No, the two hour webinar was enough, I'm done. Or great, yeah, I'm gonna do it. Or maybe, yeah, I, I might do, I might uh, download that participant manual and take a look. Maybe, maybe I'll fill out the self-assessments. What have you got to lose? But I urge you to make the most of this two hour webinar and to leave here with new ideas about your strengths and to be enthusiastic about your resilience. So we worked on remaining psychologically flexible, having a positive attitude, boundaries, understanding why you like doing your job. We'll give Barbara just a minute. She might, um, she might just be experiencing some te technical difficulties. So we'll wait just a few minutes and see if she pops back on. Uh, I'll go ahead and take this time to invite you to join our next ses session for essential workers, which is Stop the Tug of War with Time by Penny Zanker. And that will be held on Wednesday, January 13th. And um, so with that, we'll, we'll go ahead and um, we want you to share the word and let other people know definitely about um, January 13th uh, session. And we'll go ahead and just give Barbara a couple more minutes. I am back. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Okay. Um, the it says host disabled participant screen sharing, but that but that's okay. Um, unless we we only had like three three slides left. I don't know what where you saw the last one. Um, it, it, it basically it's I was just ending up by by doing a little evaluation and thanking everyone for being here. I live in New Jersey and we have a Nor'easter. So the fact that I was able to stay on for almost two hours, I feel like I was really blessed in that because I thought that we would have several times where Zoom would go off. So 
Thank you for everyone who did attend today. I appreciate that. You can reach out to me at Barbara Rebel at barbarubel.com if you want to share your story. A lot of people like to email me and just share their, their losses with me or, or their blessings with me. Both are really good. And I just want to thank Crossroads of Iowa to bringing me out. And, and Maggie, thank you. And uh, thank everyone for, for spending two hours together today. I, I hope it was what they expected. And if there are any questions, maybe we can open it up for some questions. Is that possible? Um, we could go ahead and just anyone who has a question can put it in the chat. Or they could unmute themselves too, that's fine too. Oh yeah, I'd love that. Okay, I'm, I'm not seeing any in the chat, so I okay. think we're good. Well, thank you again, Barbara, for sharing such My impactful pleasure. and timely information with us. Yes, we're so glad that we got you back for a few minutes to thank you. I know, but that it lasted almost two full hours. I was so like, I felt it. I was so afraid because we have several inches and it's ice snow. So um, I'm just so, oh, I see from Ashley. Barbara, thank you for sharing with us. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure. And I hope that as an attendee that you got what you wanted to get out of today's webinar. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'd also like to just take just one moment to thank the Southwest Iowa Mental Health and Disability Services who made these ses sessions possible with a grant. And so we're very grateful to them, grateful for everyone that joined in this evening. Uh, Barbara, we hope that you're safe in the storm and that um, all is well with you. And we will, I already invited everyone while we were on our short break um, to the next session in January. And so with that, I will just again, thank everyone and we will see you all hopefully soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.